Welcome back to this course on advanced memory hierarchy design. The topic of this lesson is loop fusion, which is a compiler technique that fuses or merges several loops in order to improve data locality. The final data access reordering technique I want to discuss is loop fusion. It is based on the observation that some programs have separate loops that access the same array or arrays. That means that if the arrays are large, larger than the cache, the data will be replaced before it is reused in the second loop. The loop fusion technique fuses or merges the separate loops into a single loop. This allows reusing the data loaded into the cache before it is replaced and this reduces the miss rate by improving temporal locality. Here's a code example with two separate loops. Both loops have the same looping structure. The first nested loop accesses the matrices A, B and C and the second nested loop access the accesses the matrices A, C and D. We see that the first loop writes AIJ and the second loop reads AIJ. If the matrices are too large to keep in cache, AIJ will be replaced before the second loop reuses it. Similarly, both the first and the second loop read CIJ. Again, if the matrices are too large to keep in cache, CIJ will be replaced before the second loop reuses it. This slide shows how the loop can be fused. This code shows the unfused loop and this is the code after the loops have been fused. Now there is a single nested loops with two statements in its body. Furthermore, when AIJ is loaded into the cache, it is immediately reused in the next statement. The same applies to CIJ. The si this simple technique should improve performance significantly. An interesting question is, when is loop fusion allowed, since it changes the execution order? Obviously, changing the execution order should not violate data dependencies. In other words, when in the original code a statement S is data dependent on another statement S prime, then S prime should still be executed before S in the fused code. Let me give an example. This is the same code as before, except that it has been modified to process arrays instead of matrices. We see that iteration i of the first loop writes ai and that iteration i of the second loop reads ai. So there is a data dependency between, this, between the statement instant i of the first loop and the statement instance i of the second loop. In general, let s let S1i be the instance i of the statement in the first loop and let S2i be the statement instant i in the second loop. Then loop fusion is allowed if and only if there is no data dependency between S1i and S2j where j is less than i. Let me prove this by a figure. A figure is not a proof but still. This graph represents the dependencies and the execution of the original unfused loops. Each node represents a statement instance, the straight arrows represent the dependencies going from top to bottom and the dashed arrows illustrate the execution order. First all statements of uh, all instances of statement S1 are executed and then all instances of statement S2 are executed. It can be seen that the execution order obeys all dependencies, as it should, of course. In other words, if statement S is dependent on S prime, then S prime is executed before S. This graph, on the other hand, represents the execution order of the fused loop. Now instances of statement S1 and S2 are executed alternately. But still the execution order obeys all dependencies. 
S2i is, depend, is data dependent on S1i and S1i is still executed before S2i. Loop fusion is not allowed in this case, however. In this code, iteration i of the second loop depends on iteration i plus 2 of the, uh, of the first loop. So there is a dependence from S1i to S2j where j is less than i. This is illustrated in this graph. <clears throat> if we now fuse the two loops, for example, S21 will be executed before S13, which is not allowed since there is a data dependency from S13 to S21. Quat erat demonstrandum, excuse my Latin. This figure shows the performance improvement obtained by the data reordering optimizations that I have discussed. Again, I want to emphasize that the optimizations have been performed manually by changing the code, but they could be performed by a compiler and modern compilers do. Often, however, compilers lack certain information such as that the arrays are non-overlapping and you either need to give them a hand, give them some hints, or you need to perform these optimizations manually yourself. It can be seen that the speedups range from very small, about 10% for the, NASA, for the NASA 7 benchmark Compress, to very large, more than 2.5x for the benchmarks VPenta and GMTY. Furthermore, the different colors indicate the optimizations that cause the improvements. Merging arrays, loop interchange and loop fusion all improve the performance of VPenta, but the other benchmarks are accelerated by only one or two techniques. Blocking only benefits the NASA 7 benchmark M times M, which in fact is matrix multiplication. Finally, two exercises. The first one asks you to name three data locality optimizations and to give a code example of one of them. The second exercise asks you to analyze if the two loops in this code can be fused. This concludes this lesson. Thank you for watching. In the next lessons, we will look at prefetching, which is a technique that reduces the miss rate or miss penalty by fetching code or data into the cache before it is needed. Stay tuned.